First, let me start off by thanking the organizers for giving me the chance to speak here. Uh, my name is Xiaowei Lin. I'm from UC Berkeley, and um, I'm from the math department. And what I do is uh, trying to study how I can use algebraic geometry to study problems in statistics. So let me start off with a motivating example. Uh, I'll be looking at uh, sparsity penalties in model selection. So for instance, if we look at the linear regression problem, OK, suppose I have a random variable y that I want to write as a linear combination of some random variables x, and let's say they're d of them. And let's say that the error epsilon is uh, normally distributed. Um, and suppose I have n uh, data samples, x, y1, x1, to yn, xn. So the typical least square solution is to uh, try to minimize the sum of squares of the residues. Uh, so this is the same as uh, maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, of course, uh, it's very popular to study penalized regression, where we add a penalty term, pi of omega, in there. And so a very uh, popular example, famous example, is lasso, where here the penalty would be the one norm of omega times some penalty uh, constant, which, is, which I call beta. Or if you look at the Bayesian information criterion, the BIC, the penalty would be the zero norm, uh, which is the number of non-zero terms in omega, times log of n, where here n is the sample size. And if we look at what's going on in this uh, optimization problem, what we're doing is that we are segmenting or partitioning the parameter space into different regions, where each region will have a different uh, penalty function on it. Uh, so for instance, on the left side, I have the lasso penalties, where for instance, in the light blue region, uh, the penalty is given by beta times the one norm of uh, absolute value of u plus beta times the absolute value of v, whereas at the origin, the penalty will be 0. And similarly, for BIC, we can think of it in this way. So here we see that the parameter space is partitioned into regions, and we can think of these regions as submodels that we're interested in. Uh, so let's study the BIC a little bit more. So there's, uh, the reason why it's called a BIC is because there's a Bayesian interpretation for this information criterion. So if you're given a region omega of the parameters, and suppose we put a prior uh, phi on the parameter space, then the marginal likelihood of the data would be the integral of the likelihood function with respect to this prior, where here f is the, uh, the likelihood, the log likelihood of the data, which is just the, sum, uh, the average sum of squares. And if we look at this uh, integral, the, a very popular way of approximating this integral is to use the Laplace integral, and here, uh, we can show that the negative log of this integral is asymptotically uh, um, n times the maximum likelihood plus d over 2 times log of n plus some constant term, where here d is the dimension of the parameter space, and here omega star is the, the maximum likelihood estimate. So we see that studying uh, model asymptotics or asymptotics of statistical integrals helps us to derive the BIC. However, the Laplace approximation only works when the model is regular. Uh, but many models that we are interested in machine learning are singular. For instance, uh, mixture models, neural networks, and hidden variables. So how do we extend this uh, asymptotic analysis uh, to those singular integrals? So uh, let us look at some uh, very classical uh, asymptotics of integrals from mathematics. And so uh, in general, there are three ways to estimate uh, integrals in statistics. The first way is the CAP 101 method, which is that you find a closed form formula for your integral. And uh, of course, this is not often possible. The second most popular way is to use numerical methods. So for instance, we could use a Mon uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo method and, uh, or Gibbs sampling or other one of your favorite sampling techniques to approximate the integral. And the third method, which I'll be looking at in my talk today, are asymptotic methods. Basically, we want to analyze how the integral behaves when the sample size grows very large. So uh, a very important concept in integral asymptotics is called uh, the real log canonical threshold. And so if we look at the classical uh, asymptotic theory, which comes out from actually roughly the 1970s, 1980s, uh, due to mathematicians by, uh, uh, like Arnold, Gusein Zadeh, and Varchenko, uh, we say, they say that if you have a general Laplace integral of this form, uh, where here f is the function they were in interested in studying, uh, then you can approximate that integral for large n in this form. And here we want to see that there are actually three components to this uh, asymptotics. 
The first term is the one that we're most familiar with. Uh, this one is an exponential function where here f star is the maximum value, sorry, is the minimum value of f. So you can think of this as the maximum likelihood estimation term. And then there is this term that, uh, that, that is n to the minus lambda and log n to the theta minus 1. Uh, this will depend on your sample size, uh, almost like a, in a somewhat like a polynomial fashion. But of course, these uh, lambda and theta values here are rash, rational numbers in general. They may not be integer. And so uh, uh, asymptotically, as the sample size grows large, we have this kind of asymptotic analysis. And so the, the numbers that we are interested in is the number lambda over here and theta up here in the exponents. And this pair of exponents will be called the real log conical threshold of the function f, which I try to integrate over here. And here, of course, the, the measure that I put on the parameter space will play a role as well. Uh, so how do we think about these integral asymptotics? What's the geometrical intuition for these things? So uh, it turns out that the in integral asymptotics will depend very much on the min minimum locus, which means the set of minimum points of f. So in very classical statistics, the model is regular, and you only have one minimizer. And so the function, uh, if you look at the integrand, e to the minus n f, I draw the graphs of e, e to the minus n f over here. If you only have one up minimum point, then what you're going to get is like a, something like a hill. And so when um, n grows large, the hill is going to get narrower and narrower. And the integral that we're interested in is the volume under this hill. So of course, you will see that this uh, volume will depend on the height of this hill, which is how we get this as a approximation ter uh, exponential term over here. But what's more interesting is after that, you want to consider the curvature of the hill near the maximum point. And this is how lambda and theta plays in over here. The, they depend on the curvature of the hill. Uh, so in this case where the hill is just one point, uh, we're, you can use a Laplace approximation. But if your hill looks more complicated, like this function here, uh, f of xy is xy, x squared, y squared, then you're going to get the locus of minimum points is going to be a cross. And so as n grows large, the volume is going to be in, concentrated under this cross. But we can't say for sure now what the exponents lambda and theta will look like. And of course, the worst example is a, you, if you have a singularity like a cusp. And what does it mean to look at the in, asymptotics of such an integral? So it, what will be very useful for studying these integrals is something called uh, resolution of singularities. So if we have a function f, so what we, are, what we hope to find is a change of variable rho. Uh, and we say that it desingularizes f if, firstly, this uh, new parameter space u uh, is a real analytic manifold that's covered by patches. So uh, one way you can visualize u is, for instance, if u is a sphere, then we can cover sphere by two patches, the north, north patch and the south patch. So each patch will be isomorphic to uh, a flat Euclidean space. And the second uh, property that we want is that rho is a proper map, which just means that the inverse images are compact. And then we want it to be isomorphic outside of the, uh, the places where f is equal to 0. You can think of this as a technical assumption. And the third one that is very important is that after this change of variable rho, we want, uh, we want the new function f to, be, to look like a monomial. So here, mu to the kappa is a monomial. And then it times multiplied by something that never becomes 0. So, so we say that this rho is a, change of, is a desingularization if it changes f into a monomial form. A monomial form. Okay, uh, so in 1964, Hironaka proved that desingularizations always exist for real analytic functions, and it was a, such a big result that he won the Fields Medal in 1970 for this. It was a very difficult proof. So coming back to our integrals, if we wanted to find the, those uh, asymptotics uh, or the real log conical thresholds, how are, how are we going to do it? Well. We know how to find the real log conical thresholds of monomial functions. Uh, this, is, this was shown by Arno, Gusein, Zada, and Vachenko uh, around the 1970s, 1980s. And so now that we know how to do it mon monomial functions, we just find a change of variable that changes f into a monomial, fu monomial function, and then apply this theorem to, to find the, the threshold. So, so here is the outline of the algorithm you use to analyze those integrals. So first, you take f, and you find the minimum of f. So this is the same as finding the maximum likelihood in statistics. 
And then the second thing that we want to do is we take now the difference in f and its minimum point, and we, and we resolve the singularities. And then after that, for each of the patches, I use this theorem for monomial functions to find the asymptotics. And then I kind of just uh, consider the aggregate of all those different patches and see what happens. And in, in this a mathematical problem, the difficult part is, actually, is finding a desingularization. So in my thesis, in my work, I'm actually looking at many statistical models and trying to find uh, desingularizations for those models. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about singular learning theory, how, how it applies what I just told you about as asymptotics of integrals to statistics. So singular learning theory, learning theory comes from this uh, Japanese uh, uh, researcher by the name of Sumio Watanabe. And in 1998, he discovered a way of studying the asymptotics, uh, asymptotic behavior of singular models. And his insight was to use a deep result in algebraic geometry known as Hironaka's resolution of singularities, which I just told you about. And uh, the text, so this is a picture of uh, Professor Watanabe. And this is the textbook that he wrote, uh, which uh, was recently translated to English, and you can find it. But the first version that was written in 2000 was in Japanese. And then uh, here, this is a picture of Professor Hironaka, who proved resolution of singularities in 1964. And uh, so the, here's the general setup for singular link theory. So first, we start off with a random variable we are interested in. And let here delta be the space of probability distributions. And our statistical model will be a subset of that space of distributions. And it will be given by the image of some parentization. And here, so omega is going to stand for my parameter space. And here, p of x given omega will be well, my notation for distribution at a certain point in the parameter space. And I'm going to assume that I have some prior on my parameter space, representing what I believe about the parameters. And so now that if we have samples, x1 to xn, which are drawn from some distribution in the model, uh, we can define two uh, statistical measures. So the first one is called the marginal likelihood, which I've already told you about. It is the integral of the likelihood function. And the second one, it is, it is a distance function uh, for, statistic, for distributions. It's called the kohlbeck lieber function. And it's given by this formula over here. And so the first main theorem uh, in singular learning theory is finding a standard form for the log likelihood ratio. So the log likelihood ratio is taking the log of the ratio of the likelihood function for the true distribution divided by the likelihood function for um, a point in my model. And we note that the expectation of this random variable is actually my kohlbeck lieber function. And so Watanabe showed that if you could desingularize the kohlbeck lieber function, you basically desingularize the likelihood ratio. Uh, so the likelihood ratio now has this form where you have some mu to the 2 kappa and mu to the kappa. Note that these only depend on your parameters, so they are deterministic. And then all the, all the, stochast the uh, randomness is being squeezed into this small random variable over here. Psi, which converges in law to a Gaussian process. So, so here, we didn't assume that the model is regular in any way. It's, it could be very singular. But no matter how singular it is, we can always put it in this nice standard form. And so uh, this is, you can think of this as a generalization of central limit theorems in uh, statistics. And so now, using his previous theorem, he was able to prove something about the marginal likelihood integral. And so. Uh, so the negative log of the marginal likelihood integral, another name for it is stochastic complexity, is given by a maximum likelihood term plus lambda times log of n plus some log log of n term, where this lambda and theta are going to come from some deterministic integral. So we started off with something that was stochastic. And now we, it turns out we only had to study something that was deter deterministic. And so if you, if you uh, specialize this theorem to regular models, this is going to be called the Bayesian inf information criterion. And the lambda and theta appearing here has many different names. In statistics, it's called the learning coefficient. And in algebraic geometry, as I said before, it's called the real log conical threshold. And so why is the geometry going on behind uh, all these theorems? So we have this uh, parameter space, which is in blue. And the image of this parameter space is going to be this blue subset over here in the red space, which is the space of all distributions. Then suppose that my data is being generated by some distribution in here. 
And so the interesting uh, points in the premises that I, will be, that I want to study would be the pre-image of, of, uh, of Q, which will, be, will be, which will be some subset. For regular models, this is just one point or a finite collection of points. But in general, for, for singular models such as neural networks, you could get something that's very complicated. And so, so it is trying to resolve the singularities of this uh, pre-image that is going to give us the asymptotics. And also, singular link theory tells us a little bit more. For instance, for if you have the AIC and the DIC, okay, we know that uh, if they come from something called the base generalization error. Uh, it is a different way of measuring statistical models. It is the Kobach library distance between the true distribution and your predictive distribution. And so asymptotically, uh, if you study what happens when the sample size grows large for this base generalization error, you're going to get the Okaiki uh, information criterion, or the AIC. So uh, in singular link theory, that was generalized. And we find out that it is still equal to some maximum likelihood term plus 2 times something called the singular fluctuation. And or numerically, we can estimate this uh, Bayesian generalization error uh, using MCMC methods. And then that has become that's a very popular criterion called the deviance information criterion. But it turns out that this criterion doesn't work well for singular models. And in singular learning theory, this was generalized. And the correct form of the, of the DIC was given as the widely applicable information criterion. And if you look at these two formulas, they are actually very, very similar. The last term is exactly the same. The only difference is th th there's a shift of this expectation over the parameter space out here. And this small different difference turns out to be the correct thing to do. And so that was my summary of single learning theory. We are just uh, now going to apply a little bit to our statistical models. So coming back to real log chronicle thresholds. OK, so um, from, on my very first slide, I looked at sparsity penalties. And I wanted to put a penalty on each point in a parameter space. So it's, it's useful for us to look at something called local log chronicle thresholds. So over, for each point in a parameter space, uh, there's a theorem which says that there is a small neighborhood of that point such that uh, for all neighborhoods which are smaller than that small neighborhood that I just gave you, the asymptotics are exactly the same. So they're always given by the same lambda and theta. So I'm going to call these the local log chronicle thresholds. And so uh, just a reminder, in maximum likelihood uh, estimation, we are interested in minimizing the likelihood function, which is given by the sum of logs of uh, the likelihoods of the data. So if we were to add a penalty to the maximum likelihood estimation, it would look like this. So, so here, uh, my work with Russell Steele is to propose that this penalty has this form, that the penalty of a point uh, in the parameter space is given by the local log chronicle threshold times log n minus theta minus 1 log log of n. And we claim that this form is the most optimal form if we want to look at um, DIC type of penalties for the model. And so uh, if, you, if you specialize this to regular models, we get exactly the BIC. And in fact, uh, we're, 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 this is something we're looking at. We are hoping that this form over here can tell us how to penalize the parameters appropriately in, in lasso or other kinds of regularization, uh, regularization methods. And um, of course, um, I can tell you that mathematically, it's very difficult to compute these numbers, lambda and theta. But there is a math geometrical method that we can use to approximate them. And that's uh, something called Newton polyhedra. So suppose that my function f uh, is this sum of monomials. Then the Newton polyhedra is going to be drawn this way. So first, I look at each monomial in here, and I plot them on my graph. And then I, I put a positive orthon on each of those uh, monomials. Then after that, I will take the convex hull of that whole blue region. And so the, everything above the red line is uh, what I call the Newton polyhedra. And suppose now I draw this diagonal line in the direction 1, 1. Uh, so this is going to be called something called a tau line. And the intersection with the polyhedron is going to be called the tau distance. And the multiplicity would be uh, the dimension of the face of this polyhedron at the intersection point. So here, the dimension of this face is 1, so the multiplicity is 1. If I shift my tau line by a little bit to 2, 1 direction, 
Then the intersection point is going to be 2, 1, and now because this point is a co-dimension 2, so the multiplicity is 2. And this uh, geometrical method actually gives us a way of bounding uh, the real log conical thresholds. So, if I, so this is just a repeat of what I just showed you in an example. Uh, so if I'm given a power series, first I plot uh, all my monomials in a graph paper, and I take the convex hull uh, of those points. That convex hull is called the Newton polyhedron. And then the tau distance would be the minimum of a line drawn in a tau direction with that polyhedron. And the multiplicity is co-dimension. So if L tau is the tau distance of my Newton polyhedron for F, and theta tau is its multiplicity, then the real log conical threshold of F with respect to some monomial uh, prior would, uh, would be bounded above by 1 divided by the distance and uh, theta. Okay, so you, you'll be wondering why I'm interested in such a monomial uh, prior. So firstly, if you look, look at gamma priors, they would look like of this, something of this form. But more generally, if you're resolving singularities, these things occur all the time. And uh, the nice thing is that if f is the sum of squares of monomials, then this thing is actually an equality. So we can actually compute these kind of uh, uh, thresholds correctly. So uh, just to summarize, so the main thing is that uh, when we're looking at machine learning, uh, when we're studying machine learning models, and a lot of the models are singular, it's very useful to study uh, how these singular, singularities can be, uh, can be analyzed and can be uh, desingularized in order to find out what happens when the sample size grows very large. So this is an example of that. And with that, um, I'm just going to end here and thank you for your attention. And uh, for more information, you can uh, read up my, so this is my thesis, uh, which I put on my website. And these are my references. Thank you. Thank you very much. So if I got your correction correctly, it's uh, what kind of conditions do we have on the parameter space for us to apply these methods? So uh, the conditions are fairly general. Uh, firstly, we require them to be compact. Um, and the second thing is that we require them to be uh, something called semi-analytic. So what semi-analytic means is that the boundary of the parameter space must be defined by inequalities, which are given by analytic functions. So for instance, uh, in most statistical cases, the, the parameter space would be, say, a, say you know, a, a, a hypercube. Or, uh, but sometimes in, in normal mixtures, the parameter space is not compact at all. So you're wondering, oh, can we still apply these methods? But it turns out that we can. This, we can for, specifically for normal mixtures, we can actually remove the compactness requirement and do that. So often, uh, it will require a case-by-case -case analysis. But the, the most general um, conditions we have on a parameter space is that it must be compact and semi-analytic. Oh, that's a really interesting question. So his question was, uh, how, how large does n have to be for these uh, asymptotics to kick in? So in my experiments, it all depends on how bad the singularity is. So one of the models that I studied, the singularity was very simple. It's just like a, you know, a cross. And then it turns out that for n equals to about 1,000, we were able to get pretty good approximations of the, our integrals. But uh, there was an ex example where I studied a, a nine-dimensional uh, parameter space where the singularities were intersections of very, very complicated looking uh, uh, surfaces. And we needed to get almost like a million sample sizes in order to, for that to happen. So you may think that, OK, this means that these methods are not good for uh, approximated integrals. But what, what it's really telling us is that if your singularities are really bad, then your methods for esti estimating integrals are going to be bad no matter what you try. MCMC or asymptotic methods or, or exact methods, they're all going to be hard. And, and th this is something that is uh, coming from how bad the singularities are in the models.